it, everyone. Uh, hello and welcome to another session of our Evolution Seminar Series. We're really excited today to have an early, early career awardee speaker join us. So we are joined by Kelsey Jenkins from Yale University in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, working in their paleo vertebrate paleontology, paleontology group. Excuse me. So please join me for, in a warm welcome for Kelsey Jenkins. Yes. Um, I'll start off by saying my voice does not project well, so if you can't hear me on the microphone, you might want to come closer, so I'll give anyone that sec. I screamed once during a presentation and people couldn't hear me, so anyway, thank you so much again for having me. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about sensory evolution, but we're going to be using the sort of macroevolutionary lens that the fossil record can provide, if I can get this clicker to work. Un momento. How's that? Okay, we're going to do this old fashioned way then. Okay, so we're going to kick this off just by talking a little bit about what senses are. And I'm sure you've heard of like the classic sort of like smell, sight, taste, sound. That's what you think of when you think of senses. But senses are just like much more abundant in the animal kingdom than just that. So many people don't realize that senses extend much further. Um, I'm sure most of us in this room have experienced things like hunger and thirst and nausea and pain and those all are part of our sensory perception. And, you know, many other animals experience other sensations that we can experience, like turtles can detect magnetic fields, which help them sea turtles like migrate throughout the oceans. Um, we have things that can do electroreception, like catfish and platypus, and that all contributes to sensory perception. And the ability to sense all this stuff, it allows organisms to take in information about their environment and basically make a decision on how to interact with their environment. So if a coyote gets hungry, it might decide to hunt or a flock of birds might decide to migrate based on how the seasons are changing or the availability of resources. And while these senses are pretty ubiquitous across the animal kingdom today, we have to keep in mind that each and every one of these senses that we observe in the animal kingdom didn't really arise from nothing. Everything has its own sort of unique evolutionary history. Um, the textbook example is the evolution of the vertebrate eye. Even Charles Darwin put this up as an example as something that definitely formed probably by natural selection, but he wasn't really quite sure how. It wasn't until much later that a lot of people figured out that, hey, we started off with something like a simple photoreceptor 600 million years ago. And then after series of mutations and things like that, we get something that's much more complex, like a really nice, you know, photo capturing eye. Now, to me, every sensory structure has just as interesting an evolutionary history and how it developed. And furthermore, even after these structures initially evolve, they are continuously morphed and shaped by evolutionary processes. Uh, for example, most vertebrates have functioning eyes. However, many cave animals don't. Um, they live environments that are devoid of light and are blind or even lack eyes entirely. Uh, one hypothesis for why this is the case is that they can devote more energy towards the development of other organs or sensory structures and things like that. So if an organ, organ isn't necessary anymore, it can become vestigial or disappear entirely. So all of that said, I'm a paleontologist, so I'm kind of interested in using the fossil record to learn more about ancient ecology and evolutionary processes and how they might affect these sort of sensory systems. Um, here you see a couple of Cretaceous crabs. We're gonna talk about them in just a moment. Um, but before we get into that, I have sort of a set of guiding principles to sort of get us through this kind of paleontological macroevolutionary work. So first thing to keep in mind, sensory structures may have arisen from organs that previously looked and functioned really different from how they might look and function today. Um, acceptation or the idea that you know, a structure can take on a function that differs from its original function is a really common theme, and we'll see a little bit of that today. Next, ecology and behavior um, have really strong effects on sensory structures and how they evolve and what they might look like. Um, and as a result, any two species might have you know, the same organ, but they might look and function very differently depending on their ecology and how they are using those organs. And then finally, new senses can develop over time and they can disappear too. And looking at those patterns of, of loss and gain over really long macroevolutionary timescales, like what the fossil record can provide, can tell us some really interesting things about ancient environments and how lineages respond to climatic changes or major sort of earth upheavals over millions of years. So 
things like extinction events and subsequent radiations can all influence what these sensory structures look like. So keeping all those things in mind, I have sort of three vignettes from my own research to share with you that sort of explore sensory evolution across various living or living and extinct groups of animals. So firstly, we're going to talk about a really peculiar crab. This guy's really cute. I also had a really traumatic time with this research, <laughs> so I hope you really like it. Um, anyway, so we're going to talk about a really cute crab with weird eyes from the Cretaceous. Then we're going to go a little bit further back in time and switch phyla entirely to talk about reptiles and how they evolved hearing. And then finally, we're going to switch gears one last time to talk about what is the third eye, which is like kind of my recent obsession. It's one of my favorite PhD chapters. Um, and we're going to talk about how that influences the evolution of thermoregulation. So first things first, we're talking about this tiny crab, Polychimera perplexa. I love this video. Anyway, so it's a tiny crab. Um, it's about the size of a U.S. quarter. You can fit several of them in the palm of your hands. Um, and one of the features that really stands out, well, there's kind of a couple weird things going on. We're going to talk about the weird body plan in this crab. Um, Cali Camara has a few weird things. First of all, it has these like giant sort of oar-like legs. And I think most of you, when you think of a crab, do you think of something like the blue crab, kind of like the swimmy crab, right? So very similar to the blue crab here, but swimming in crabs is actually a really unusual thing. I think out of like the thousands of species of crabs, very few crabs actually do this. Most of them walk along the seafloor or along the shoreline. There's a few that even like climb trees, which is terrifying. You should Google that sometime. Anyway, so we have this really unusual feature, number one. Unusual feature two is that we have this sort of fusiform streamlined body shape. Again, when you think of crabs, you probably think of something like the blue crab, this sort of like tapered at the side sort of appearance. So we have this really unusual sort of body plan. We do see this somewhere else in the crab world. There's a group called frog crabs. These are fossorial. So they need this sort of slender streamlined body to sort of wedge them into sediments. So again, we have this sort of like or like leg, this streamlined body. And then finally, these absolutely humongous eyes. They're about 16% of the animal's body size. Just for comparison, if my eyes were 16% of my body size, they would be about the size of a basketball. So absolutely insane. Again, we don't see this in a lot of places in the crab world. We do see them in a couple of species of deep sea crab. So these are animals that are hunting in the deep sea and they need really big eyes to take in just like a little bit of light that's available via, bi via bioluminescence. Uh, what is kind of weird though, is that all these little deep sea crabs, their eyes are on eye stalks. So if there's any sort of danger or something that could harm the eye, they can actually bring the eye back into the body. Pali Chimera cannot do that. So it has these absolutely humongous eyes that are just like out there in space and isn't like the super safest thing that you could be doing. Anyways, because of this weird combination of features, a lot of people have come to call Cali Chimera the platypus of crabs. But we do see this sort of body plan elsewhere in the crab world, and that's in the megalopa. This is the name that we give to a larval crab. So larval crabs, they kind of all look a little bit something like this. They have this sort of like skinny body, really big eyes, and they're not so much swimming, but they're floating around in the water column. So we have Cali Chimera, who is an adult crab, but it's retained all of these juvenile features. So it's a giant baby crab is like what we like to call it. Anyways, we've seen a lot of really nice models so far. This is what the fossil record looks like. Um, these are really exceptional fossils. If you look closely, you can see all the different little segments of the legs and the body are really well preserved. We can see the eyes just hanging out there in space. These things are absolutely humongous and really well preserved. If we look on the right side of the screen, you can see just how well that preservation is. You can see all the little components of the eye and that varies from retina, the optic lobe, axon bundles, all sorts of little like itty bitty delicate tissues that very rarely preserve. And if you zoom in far enough at the bottom here, you can even see the underlying cells that make up the facets. So this is really excellent preservation. And when you have these things occurring in large sample sizes with such excellent preservation, you can begin to ask questions like, how is this crab actually using its eyes to navigate the world? Anyways, to address this, there's a couple different things we can do. We took sort of a, a multi-pronged approach. We can look at things like the lenses, the actual facets themselves, and we can quantify the way in which they're arranged. And we use that to sort of figure out how crisp of an image this animal could see. We can look at things like growth rates. 
So if you're using your eyes, you tend to grow them pretty quickly. That seems intuitive. If you're not using them so much, they tend to grow very slowly. Similarly, we can look at body proportions. Again, it's kind of intuitive. If they're larger, you're probably using them. And if you're not, they're probably going to be a bit more on the small side, maybe even vestigial or gone entirely. And finally, we can take a look at everything we know about the eyes and we can support those inferences with basically how the rest of the body plan is looking like and try to determine how this animal is interacting with its environment. So to start out, we're gonna talk a little bit about growth rates. And to do this, it's a pretty simple technique. It's just calipers and measurements, looking at the size of the, the carapace, basically the body length, as well as the diameter of the eyes. And we did this for Cali Chimera, our fossil crab across several dozen specimens. That's an excellent sample size for fossils in case anyone has any concerns about that. But we needed sort of a comparative database as well. If we wanna know what Cali Chimera is doing with its eyes, we need to look at some modern crabs and figure out what they're doing with their eyes and sort of get like an ecological model. So where the hard work comes in is that we measured 14 different species of crabs. This was over a thousand specimens total to try to determine how these eyes are growing as the, basically the animal grows. Um, so this is my co-author, Javier Luque, who is like crab man extraordinaire. If you ever want to work on crabs, you're going to see his dream somewhere. We were roommates for a while and we had a third roommate and she had like a normal desk job. So we would just be like smelling like disgusting crab stuff for weeks. And then we get home and she wouldn't talk to us, which was super cool. Anyways, cool content. Here's where the actual raw data is going to come in. Can you tell I gave this to like a lay person talk? Anyways, um, so this is just a single graph here. This is what the data looks like for our fossil crab on the X axis. You see the length of the body on the Y axis. You see the eye size. And basically each one of these data points is an individual fossil. And the line going through them, basically it's an optical growth rate that tells us how fast the eye is growing in comparison to the body. But now let's put this in context of the rest of our sample of crabs. Um, so I'm not gonna bog you down in the tiny details, but I do wanna point out that if you see a steeper slope, basically the eyes are growing faster. If you see a smaller slope, the eyes are growing slower. Here's our fossil crab. And you can see it's got the fastest optical growth rate of our entire sample. But basically this whole first row has a really sort of high optical growth rate. So let's try to figure out what these things are doing. So here we have our sampler platter of crabs. Pause for laughter. Thank you. Anyways, um, so what we see in these crabs is that they're all, what they have in common is that they're all very reliant on their vision but they're using their vision in different ways to sort of navigate their world. So we have things that are really active in the sunshine. They're either living higher in the water column or along like the shoreline. We do have one deep sea crab, but he's a really proficient hunter. So he needs really big eyes basically in these darker ecosystems to take in light and find its prey. This thing's been known to go after like squid, which I think is pretty impressive for a crab. Um, so we have things that are a couple things that are actually very proficient hunters. And then we have this guy in the middle here. This is a fiddler crab, if you're not familiar. The males have a really big claw and they like to wave it around and drum it around a bit to attract a female. So they're engaging in this very visual sort of mating behavior. So what they all have in common is that they are making a living using their eyes, but they're doing different things. So we can probably infer what's obvious is that Cali Camara is also using his eyes, but we don't exactly know what he's using them for. Is he a hunter? Is he engaging in some sort of dance. I mean, we can't really figure that out, can we? But what can we figure out about this crab? So to pin this down, we're gonna dive into a few more analyses. As I mentioned earlier, we can look closely at the facets and actually quantify the way in, what, in which they're arranged. And it's important to know that animals with compound eyes like crabs and insects, they tend to have a more like pixelated view of the world. And the size and the arrangement of these individual facets can really impact how crisp that image is. If they're really well-organized, well-arranged, they tend to see a much nicer image than if they're sort of poorly spaced and poorly arranged. Um, so anyways, what we did is we looked up the super fun equation. Pause for laughter. Thank you. Anyways, super fun equation. Basically, we took some measurements of those individual facets and we can use that to determine how crisp of an image this animal could see. So what we see here is the scale, the closer you are to zero, the more crisp of an image you can probably see. Here's Cali Chimera right here. And it is a comparative scale, but we see some interesting things on this list that are closer to that smaller value. We see things like dragonflies, which are very proficient hunters. Um, they're very apt flyers and they engage in sort of like a predatory honing behavior so they can seek out a target and, and fly towards it. Very similarly, um, mantis shrimp, 
have a very similar behavior. So we see Kelly Chimera sort of situated in between these two different arthropods here. Now with a few tweaks to that equation, we can also determine how much light the animal was capable of taking in with its eyes. And we kind of use that as a proxy to determine how well lit this animal's environment was. Again, we see much lower values, which is associated with brightly lit environments compared to something like trilobites, which are extinct, um, as well as isopods. They tend to have much higher values that are associated with living in the deep sea and not taking in a lot of light. So we have this animal that's very predatory, potentially living in a well-lit environment, and with that swimmer's body, it's probably living high in the water column opposed to something along the shoreline. So let's go over what we've learned so far. These eyes are really huge for its body size. We know that they grow really fast. It has sharp, focused vision and it's likely living high in the water column. And we compare that with what we know about the body itself. It's probably swimming very well. This is a swimming animal that is engaging in some sort of predatory behavior using its eyes to do so. And even in the same deposits, we have a candidate for a prey item, these teeny tiny itty bitty comma shrimp that are found in the thousands associated with this fossil crab. So I think that's pretty cool, but it's kind of all well and good what we can learn from a single fossil crab just by examining the eyes, but it is more than just that. The eye is a really great model for understanding how ecology and behavior are just so intimately tied to a single trait like vision. And with the huge diversity of crabs and all of them exhibiting their own combination of ecologies and behaviors, it's a really incredible system uh, to basically learn more about the ways and even the speeds in which traits change. So learning about this one crab is really just like a drop in the bucket compared to everything that we have to learn about vision and the evolution of vision as a system. So I don't work on crabs anymore, but if you're really excited to, I could put you in touch with, with people who do, because it is a really cool place that I think you could step off from. So with that, that was vignette one. Um, we saw the diverse ways and the different forms of compound eye can take when faced with different environments. But now we're going to take sort of a hard turn into a different type of sensory evolution, that being how reptiles evolved hearing. So to get us started, I'd like to show you a, a diagram of your own ear. It's probably something you've seen in like high school or undergrad biology. And we know that the inner ear bones of the human ear are the malleus, incus, and stapes, right? And basically, thanks to the fossil record, we know that these three bones evolved from the lower jaw of ancient mammal, mammal relatives that eventually got smaller and migrated up towards the skull. It's a really excellent <laughs> example of how the fossil record can tell you about the evolution of the sensory stru structure. But reptiles have taken a really different path in order to hear. Instead of those three bones, the malleus, incus, and the stapes, reptiles just use one the stapes. In modern reptiles, from the diagram here, you can see the stapes are really like long and slender sort of bone that connects the eardrum or the tympanum to the inner ear. So again, in the simplified diagram, you can see there's like a lot more going on here with different tissues and muscles and ligaments, but you can see here that the sound waves would first encounter the tympanum and then travel down the stapes into the inner ear where those vibrations are interpreted as sound. And this type of stapes, this really long and slender bone, it's what we see pretty much across most living reptiles today, except for a few that are like weird and don't really hear anymore. However, this really teeny tiny delicate bone capable of hearing these high frequencies in reptiles, it didn't really get to be that way up until about the Triassic, somewhere in the ballpark of about like 220 million years ago, give or take. In early reptiles and even early tetrapods, the stapes was a really bulky bone. You can't tell from this diagram, but some of them are a couple inches long and wide. So these are way too large and bulky to you know, sense any sort of high frequency sounds. But that makes total sense, uh, considering that the earliest tetrapods didn't really hear airborne sounds. <laughs> They're living underwater. And these animals sense their surroundings in a totally different way than land animals do. When vertebrates first transitioned on the land and they were colonizing land, they had to overcome challenges like breathing air and not drying out, and not collapsing under their own body weight. It's not until they sort of tackle these bigger problems that they start to fine tune other senses along the way. So here we are, we have the super bulky stapes and ancient tetrapods and ancient reptiles. And we have this long slender stapes in modern lineages of reptiles, but there's basically no transitional forms recognized. And that's where I'm like, where are the, where are the medium stapes, you know? And then last year we published this redescription of a poorly known Triassic reptile called Palacridon. Um, and we found this, this is the stapes and it looks pretty different from 
either extreme of very bulky to very slender. And as I started to search the literature, I noticed that Plagranon wasn't alone. There's actually several reptiles that are phylogenetically speaking, kind of close to these reptiles with very slender stapes. Um, and they do have sort of this, this medium build going on. So does that mean we have a medium ability to hear in reptiles? Um, I mean, that would be really cool if we did, but as it happens as I was writing this paper, I noticed that a lot of people were kind of describing things in a very like binary way, either very good at hearing or very bad at hearing essentially. So these transitional forms are sort of lost on us because we only know how to recognize these two things. Anyways, that's where the paper kind of ended, but I've been thinking a lot lately about how we can potentially take this research one step further. Can we actually test the ability of these stapes to transmit sound? Um, and if so, can we test the hypotheses that there might actually be an intermediate form that existed about 250 million years ago? Um, and the spoiler alert is I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm actually putting this into a postdoc proposal right now. So I'm kind of showing you the plan. And in the question period, you can tell me how much you hate this plan, if that sounds good. Anyways, so just to remind you, we're looking at this middle bone, the stapes. Here's where it is in the skull. And keep these really beautiful images in mind as I show you an extremely ugly prototype. Here it is. Anyways, so this big block is representing that skinny bone. Eardrum is on the right, where it would be interacting with sound. Inner ear is on the left. And we're going to model sound waves as if they're traveling from right to left, as if they're hitting that eardrum going into the inner ear. And it would kind of look something like this. And I'm sure this animation looks nice, but it doesn't really mean anything. What we're actually looking for is a diagram like this, something that would tell us what are the minimum and maximum frequencies that this bone is capable of hearing. So that's kind of what the plan is, figuring out what those minimum and maximums are. And again, we don't have any real data yet. What the next step would be would actually be to look at reptile skulls, digitally remove that stapes and actually model it from there. So what you're looking at is the stapes of an early reptile relative called Capturinus. And as it spins around, you can see like, it's got sort of a long slender bit, but it's mostly pretty bulky. It has a really sort of wide, broad base. This is not an animal that's probably very adept at hearing, but I'm hoping to actually quantifying that using the, the methods I showed you on the previous slide. So I have a couple of data points so far, at least like the models for them, but that's something I'm hoping to tackle late, later. But as we get a larger sample size and test this, hopefully the data will show the manner in which reptiles evolved to hear. And I think it's super interesting to flesh out this question because it's such a unique sense used to interpret the world. And despite how unique it is, both reptiles and mammals, the closest relatives to one another, evolve this sense independently around the same time. So even though it's far from complete, there's already something we can say a little bit about sensory evolution. Um, I think it's really incredible that both the reptile line and the mammal line managed to converge on a sense. Sure, they used different bones to do it, but regardless, they basically came up to a solution. Um, and I think this is just a great place to talk about how evolution doesn't make a perfect organism and evolution can't make something out of nothing. It basically works with the materials at hand. And if you have the right materials at hand, you can make a functional ear. And to bring that back to our case study on vision, these two senses really sort of illustrate the different paths that sensory evolution can take as a whole. So that's kind of the unfleshed part. I'll give you one more vignette, and this is the very much more fleshed. I'm hoping to submit this in the next six months or so. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the third eye. And I'd like to start off with a little bit of a fun fact. Many lizards, as well as their close relatives, the New Zealand tuatara, possess basically a rudimentary eye. They have an extra special scale located on the top of the head that covers this thing. So this is an example from a fence lizard. Basically, if you dissected the skull um, right at the location of that scale, this is what you would see. This is an actual eyeball, retina, lens, and cornea. The only thing that is missing is the iris. So it can't actually expand and like, contract like a normal eye would be. So this is not an image forming eye. It's basically detecting light and dark. Now, what I think is cool, but maybe it's obvious to you, is that there's evidence of this eye, even if you just have the skull, which makes it really useful as a paleontological proxy. Um, so this is the skull of the New Zealand tuatara, and where this arrow appears, there's a hole on the skull that would be housing that parietal eye. So it's located between the two parietal bones, so you'll hear it called the parietal eye, or maybe even the pineal eye. This is an organ that's really closely associated with the pineal gland. <laughs> 
Now, just for comparison, I have the skull of a wolf. Like all mammals, it does not have that pineal opening. It does not have that parietal eye, but it does have a pineal gland that's tucked within the brain. Similarly, some reptiles also lack this feature like crocodilians and turtles. But for what this organ actually does, there's been a slew of hypotheses over the years. And I admit, I think this is an area that needs way more fundamental research. But we do have a rough idea that it has something to do with the ability to regulate body temperature in ectothermic or cold-blooded tetrapods. And it's intimately linked with pineal gland and the endocrine system. So I want you to imagine like your typical lizard, it's basking in the sun and it's getting nice and warm. And getting warm basically activates that pineal gland and allows metabolism to speed up. They can digest more easily. Basically, it's, it's controlling all of this lizard's body functions. And when it's done basking, maybe he's overdone a little bit, the pineal eye basically signals that it's time to go back into the shade. So it's not just about detecting light and dark. It's basically keeping watch on all the body's most important functions. And it uses light to basically signal those processes to the lizard. Now, there is one additional hypothesis that this organ might be linked to latitude. And the reason that latitude might be something we have to consider is that there's been some suggestion that there is a geographical relationship between the size and presence of this parietal foramen and the pineal eye among modern lizards. While many lizards do have that parietal eye, some don't. And it's been observed that species without a parietal eye occur in larger proportions closer to the equator. And those with occur in larger proportions as you move to higher latitudes. And in some ways, this is like, it's kind of a really solid hypothesis. There's less variation in temperature as you move close to the equator. There might be less need for an organ to help you regulate your body temperature in that case. However, there's kind of an issue with the hypothesis as well. The trend was noted by mapping the distribution of lizard families, which were in large part geographically restricted. So it's kind of hard to say if this latitudinal gradient of parietal eyes is due to how they function at different latitudes, or is it a product of where certain groups of lizards that have certain features in common happen to be distributed? So being a paleontologist, I really wanted to tackle this issue because it has some pretty major implications for how we might interpret the presence or absence of this feature when we look at the fossil record. In order to understand the anatomy of ancient animals, we need to pin down what these organs are doing in modern animals. So to test this hypothesis, we looked at a single species of lizard, Anolis sagrii. It's found across the entirety of the Gulf Coast and many Caribbean islands and parts of Central America as well. And where this arrow appears, you'll see that's the hole for the parietal eye. So for this work, I CT scanned 57 specimens total from populations found at three different latitudes from Cuba, the Bahamas, and Florida, Southern Florida. And all these populations are isolated from one another. So it provides a really good opportunity to test this hypothesis. And if latitude plays a role, we would expect those closer to the equator would have a smaller parietal foramen. And as you move to higher latitudes, we would expect them to get larger. And from there, we need to take some measurements. So measure the basically the diameter of the parietal eye. And just to scale these data, we looked at the size of the parietal of the foramen magnum as well as the orbit. And we basically combined all these variables in a slew of different statistical ways. And we have dozens and dozens of plots. But basically, what they all say is that there was no sort of latitudinal trend. For nearly all these data, there was no consistent increase or decrease in size across these different latitudes. So we see that this latitudinal hypothesis doesn't really stand up, at least in this instance. So when I saw these data, all I could think about was, what does it mean when we interpret the size or the presence of this organ in the fossil record, it could be potentially more closely linked to behavior than it is to latitude. And there's something else we can keep in mind about these lizards that maybe supports this. All these lizards without that parietal eye are all geckos and geckos are nocturnal. And if you're going out at night, you don't exactly need an extra organ on top of your head getting signals from the sun. So it kind of makes sense. So all of that sets me up with a solid research question. If we know that there's skeletal evidence of the parietal eye, can we track the evolution of this feature in the fossil record? And, and spoiler alert, yes, we can, or I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> but since we know that this organ has a strong connection with behavior and possibly temperature regulation metabolism, can we use the fossil record to learn more about the physiology of these animals or even major shifts in physiology? Can it tell us more about how extinct organisms interacted with their environment? And if we see those major shifts in physiology, what can that tell us about the changing environment of Earth's past? So it turns out this one organ is extremely important for understanding major changes in the fossil record.
So to look into this a little further, we're looking at the fossil record of early reptile and early mammal ancestors. This is a period of about 100 million years going from the late Carboniferous to the end of the Triassic where you see this yellow circle appears. And we see that these are animals that cover a really wide variety of body shapes and sizes. We have herbivores, we have carnivores, we have things that swim and things that climb. And what we can see from all the images here is that we have a really wide variety in the size and shape of that parietal foramen that houses that parietal eye. And when you start to line these things up by time, you kind of start to notice a trend. Our earliest things have that hole in their head, but it's kind of small. It's not the most conspicuous element of the skull. But as we move a little later into time, middle Permian, we see that that hole gets much larger relative to the rest of the skull. And then as we move into the end of the Permian into the Triassic, we see that hole gets smaller again and it completely disappears in some lineages entirely. So that sets me up with a really nice hypothesis that the size of the parietal foramen changes significantly over time. And to test that, we took basically the same measurements, but this time across a series of fossil skulls. We measured over 300 skulls entirely. And when we start to bend these things by time, we see some pretty interesting trends that match up with those initial observations. There is an increase as we move into the middle Permian, just for it to decrease again, as we hit the end of the Permian into the Triassic. For those who don't know, there's a huge mass extinction at that time, so maybe that's interesting. And then it increases again in the middle Triassic, just for it to decrease all over again. We also noticed that there was sort of like a directional shift. So some, some things lose them entirely, but the things that keep them, we notice that they, they get longer than they are wider over time. We don't really know if that means anything yet, but just an interesting little observation there. But where do we go from here? What does it mean? To understand these data better, it's kind of important to understand the, the changing environment that's occurring during this long stretch of time. So compared to today, the Permian was much hotter than what we experienced, and the time is typically characterized by really arid and dry climates. We also have the collapse like worldwide of Carboniferous rainforests. So we're transitioning from this very sort of canopy covered earth to a system that is much more arid and dry, dry and, and very open, very open sort of sunny environments that are characterizing larger proportions of earth than it did previously. Permian is also sort of characterized by this giant supercontinent called Pangaea. And when you have a giant continent like this, you get something called continental climate. So you have much larger fluctuations on both a daily and seasonal basis of temperature and humidity and things like that. So the hypothesis we're throwing out there is that if you're alive during this time, maybe having a larger parietal foramen is better able to help you navigate this sort of system and regulate your body temperature in a much more arid, fluctuating sort of temperature sort of world. At the moment, we don't really have a way to test this hypothesis, but we're throwing it out there and maybe one day myself or someone else can maybe find a way to test it in the future. Now, the end of the Permian is marked by the worst extinction known in Earth's history. We have these large igneous provinces that are erupting gigatons of carbon dioxide, increasing Earth's temperature dramatically over a relatively short period of time. Uh, if we remember, this is when we see those parietal framing gets much smaller again. And it's estimated that like 70% of land species go extinct, something like 80% of marine species go extinct at this time. And it's kind of hard to pinpoint why the things that survived did so, but there's a few hypotheses as to why those things survived that we can talk about a little bit. First off, uh, we see that burrowing animals make up a large component of those survivors. The end Permian in the earliest Triassic is marked by a pretty large number of burrows and burrowing species compared to previous times or even today. And burrows provide really excellent protection from harsh environments. Burrows that are even just a few feet deep provide much more stable conditions and temperature and humidity. And if we remember how extreme that Permian environment is and how it only becomes more extreme with the onset of the extinction event, burrows provide a really excellent shield for these conditions. Now, if you're a burrower, you're potentially spending less time outside and there's less need to have an organ on top of your head that uses the sun to regulate body processes. One example of this, this is a, a amphibian. These are modern worm lizards. They burrow and you notice that they don't have a hole on top of their skull because they're not really going outside and receiving any sort of thermoregulation communication from the sun in that way. Now the second hypothesis was that endotherms survived really well. Because endotherms are able to regulate their body temperature without the use of the sun, well, you don't exactly need an organ on top of your head that receives those signals to the sun that tells you that it's time to go outside and regulate your body temperature. 
And during this time, we see endothermia rise in two lineages, basically the mammal ancestors, as well as the archosaurian ancestors. So those are the ancestors of crocodilians and birds, both of which lose those parietal eyes. And without the parietal foramen taking up important real estate on the skull, both of these lineages do something really interesting as well. Um, so what you're looking at is basically a cross section of the skull and a bunch of sort of example early reptiles. And what you see, all these like, ooh, oh, finally this clicker works. All these brown bits, that's bone, and all these sort of white stripy bits, that's muscle. And over a period of millions of years, areas of bone start to resorb, and muscles find more attached, more efficient ways to attach to the top of the skull. So we see both early mammal ancestors, archosaurs, evolve some of the most efficient and proficient bite ports, bite forces that we we see, at least at this point in time in Earth's evolution. And without this parietal frame and taking up important real estate on the skull you have more room to attach those muscles. So I've, I've thrown a bunch of like hypotheses and things in the air. We don't know cause and effect just yet. We just kind of know they all belong in the same pot of soup, if that makes sense. But I think that tells us a lot about the Triassic landscape as it recovers. That includes things like early archosaurs and their dinosaur descendants that have evolved the ability to regulate their body temperature and other processes as well as extremely strong, proficient jaw muscles, making many of them fierce predators. And at the same time, we have mammals evolving. And while they're not the top dogs yet, they're creeping onto this landscape too. And they're doing something really interesting as well. There's an idea that when mammals first evolved, they're nocturnal at this time. As you saw earlier with our geckos, if you're nocturnal, you don't necessarily need an organ on top of your head that receives signals from the sun. Okay, so we've learned a lot. We know that the parietal eye is an organ that helps ectotherms regulate their body temperature. It's not strongly linked to geography as some folks might have thought in the past. In fact, it's probably more closely linked to behavior and moderate, moderating thermoregulation as well as circadian rhythm. And in Earth's past, animals with a parietal eye, it's changed shape and size throughout Earth's history. And those changes are linked to both major environmental conditions as well as other anatomical and behavioral changes that we see in these animals over the course of millions of years. So with that, thank you all so much for your attention. A uh, shout out to my co-authors and funding sources, and I'm happy to take any questions. So, um, just curious, have you noted that there's any, uh, or has anyone noted correlations between the size, shape, position of the parietal eye and the other two that might hint at some shared function or shared regulation or something like that? To be honest, there's so much, in my opinion, like fundamental research in the parietal, as I got sort of like wrapped up in this project and looking at fossils. You know, it's really hard to know what a fossil animal is doing if you don't have a modern analog. And as I got way too deep in this project, I was like, oh God, there's like no modern analogs for, for most of this. So I don't think anyone has looked in that in particular. I think there's been more just comparison of like, what are the what's the individual makeups of this eye versus like the two eyes on your face? And the largest difference is probably that retina. So we know it's not image forming, but it's probably detecting light and dark and that it does influence at least lizard behavior a little bit. Like if you shield that eye with like a piece of, of opaque tape or something like that, lizards in controlled and like experimental settings do act differently than those without. Um, but as far as like, let's cover all three, I'm not really sure. <laughs> yes. Have you or anybody looked at the uh, anatomy of hearing and uh, lung fish and amphibian? It's like there was a really awesome talk at SICBI a couple years ago where a young master's student basically took a segmentation of a frog ear and did this exact process. I'm using a lot of her methods here and it was stunning and it seemed really efficient as at least a way to measure these sort of processes. Um, but I'm not sure if that ever got published. In any one of these vignettes, if there's one like smaller fact that you could snap your fingers and just know about it, is there something, is there some really pressing or burning thing that you really wish you could just know better? Oh, it's totally like the parietal eye. Like, what does it really do? You know, like all the studies that first come out, 
it's kind of a large comparison of more like the pineal gland across animals. And the pineal gland in mammals actually kind of acts a little bit differently than it does in reptiles. I mean, it, they're separated by 300 million years of, of evolution. So of course there's gonna be some fine tuning and physiological differences. Um, but if we could really know what it does, it would have so many implications for where we see increases and decreases and, and complete losses in the fossil record. The imaging, this is a super impressive. What Thank you. sorts of methods are you using to get the images of the skulls? Um, most of this is CT data. So at Yale, we have a really lovely um, amphibian and reptile collection. So I spent a good summer <laughs> put, like working 80 hours a week at the CT scanner, just putting things in and out of CT scanners. And uh, from there, you kind of have the option to like segment things, like digitally isolate individual bones or, or take just linear measurements. So the actual measuring of things is, is pretty simple. It's mostly linear measurements, but actual image capture is where things are still like pretty cutting edge or state of the, state of the art, I should say. Yes. Looking at, the, at what you are able to see from the fossil record with this third eye, are you, do you see any Geographical or like That's kind of the next thing I want to do because like I think the anole data is a really great start, but it is one species over pretty what is like relatively speaking a limited latitudinal gradient. Um so one like looking at another extant species to see if it does the same thing. And then looking at where our fossils are collected from, you know, like fossil exposure is really varied across the planet. So you might have a ton of fossils that are collected from one deposit in Canada. Um, and if you see this sort of gradiate, like gradation from this one latitude, that probably signals more variation behavior in this one region, sort of like different niche occupation. But if you take a whole smattering, if you had like a perfect fossil record where things are collected equally across different latitudes, maybe you would see a different trend. Yes. So you use the word temperature regulation. You might a uh, little mind the uh, uh, answer with that as uh, uh, influencing basking behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that too simple to speak of? Uh, I think it works in this instance um, because that's most of our endotherm or exotherms are using basking in order to thermoregulate. Um, or at least looking for warm surfaces. For example, snakes, um, they will bask at night, but basically they'll go onto a road that's been absorbing heat all day. Um, it works a little bit differently, but a lot of sort of complicated variables to put in there. Yes. Kind of follows up. This is a question. So you don't see this progression of lions in any snakes at all? In early lizards? I think snakes have lost it. Don't quote me on that, but also quote me on that. Um, there are a few groups of lizards that have lost it entirely, like our geckos have lost it. Fossorial things have mostly lost it. I had there, I met this one guy two weeks ago at a conference where I presented this stuff, and he was looking at lizards, um, and this he was looking at the evolution prior to in lizards, and what he found was that things that are about to burrow, like sort of moving into that niche, the parietal eye gets much larger for a little bit, as if they're trying to compensate for this new behavior. And then once they're like fully fossorial, they completely lose it. Yes. Um, so on these modern day living lizards in the parietal eye, do we know anything about like, is there like the rod and cone distribution? Is that similar to like the regular eye? Or is that um, neurophysiologically? That is an excellent question. I'll be honest with you, I have no clue, but because it's not really an image forming eye, I would guess that the rod and cone distribution probably isn't like spectacular. Like I'm not really sure on the ability to distinguish colors. Yes. So since it's not image forming, does that mean it not detect motion at all, at all? Well, so if you can detect light and dark, and you have an instant change between the two, you're probably sensing some degree of motion. I mean, you still have two functional eyes on top of your, <laughs> on the front of your face that you could detect all those things with. Um, I wanna say there was one study where, God, how did that go? It was something along the lines of detecting 
predators overhead, like birds and things like that, like does does that inform those behaviors? And I think the results were kind of wishy-washy. I think the results were like, maybe. And that's where I think the fundamental work kind of lacks. And I think I just talked to an incoming PhD student who was like, I want to work on this. And I was like, good, I have like 20 ideas <laughs> that would just like fill in all these gaps. So if there's no more questions from the general community, from that online, please join me again and thank you, Kelsey Jenkins, for a very wonderful presentation. Thanks.